Well, to start this sermon this morning, I have a question for you. Here's your question. What do you call an insomniac's family tree? Time's up. You call it a napkin. <laughs> now, if you think that one's bad, I have worse. All right, I just just want to tell you, but I want to talk to you a little bit uh, this morning about the genealogy of Jesus. Doesn't that sound exciting? Aren't you glad you fought your way through the fog to come here about a genealogy this morning? How many of you have traced and researched some of your family tree how many of you have done some of that all right we got a number of people who have um, how many of you have used ancestry.com we got some people who've done that I, um, I I studied mine a while back and I did it real quick and just I didn't like what I found So I just kind of ended my search right there. Uh, I didn't realize my family was known so much for moonshining. All right. It's a little. Yeah, so I, so I just kind of ended my search there. Didn't want to dig up any more skeletons to my family tree. Um, but genealogies were very, very important to the Jewish people. Um, now, for most of us, if we're on the one-year Bible reading program and we get to a genealogy, well, you have to read it to say that you've read the whole Bible in a year. So most of us speed read it, all right, and just zoom right past it. I know in my Bible reading, I usually start out real well at the beginning of the year and I have some momentum going till I get to like 1 Chronicles chapter 1 through 9, where all nine chapters are genealogies. There's so many names, I didn't even take time to count them, but it, it seems like your mo momentum slows down a little bit when you get there. All right. Genealogies. Genealogies. As we think in terms of the genealogy of Jesus, uh, if you want to follow along, I'm going to be looking at Matthew chapter 1. Let me make this point. The, the, I guess we could actually say that Jesus' family tree is the very first Christmas tree. I mean, literally. The first one. For those of you who don't like genealogies, who skip that particular passage of the Bible, and by the way, I've been pastoring now, been in the ministry for about 41 years. I've never preached from a genealogy in my life. This is new, entirely new material to me today. But I'll be honest, God spoke to me through the genealogy of Jesus. How many of you think he can do that? How many of you think that the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work? All Scripture. That includes the genealogies. They're profitable. There's a reason why they are in the Bible. And so that's kind of what I want to preach on this morning. To us, the genealogy of Jesus would have been kind of a strange place to begin the New Testament. 
after 400 silent years where God did not speak to his people. And then we begin here with a genealogy. But to the Jewish people, this would have been the perfect way to begin talking about Jesus was his genealogy. It's a perfect place to begin. All right. They wouldn't have thought of any other way to begin the book of Matthew than this. Let me give you some reasons why genealogies were so important to the Jewish people. The first one was they, they determined the priesthood. All right. The genealogies, you had to be a descendant of Levi, the tribe of Levi, in order to be a priest. So they had to be able to trace their genealogy to the fact that they were of the tribe of Levi, otherwise they couldn't be a priest. Another one was uh, the genealogies were important in determining who the heirs to the throne were going to be, who the kings were going to be. It, 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 it was all about your genealogy, your genealogy. Genealogies were used to determine inheritance rights. Uh, how the promised land was going to be divided up because they, the promised land was divided up among the tribes. Okay, So you had to know your genealogy so you knew what was going to be your land inheritance. All right? this, this was very important to the Jewish people. For us today, we can blow off our genealogies. and It doesn't seem to really matter a whole lot, but it mattered to them. It was important to them. And I guarantee you, it wasn't just important to them, it was very interesting to them. They would have loved this passage right here. They would have loved it. Now, another thing in, um, in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and, and 3, the only way that you could be sure about your ancestral hometown was to know your genealogy. All right? It's the only way. This is a huge part of the Christmas story. The genealogy is a huge part, okay? Because in Luke chapter 2, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the entire Roman world and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary. This is all genealogically based. He had to find out where his town of ancestry was so that he could go register for this tax. Okay? You had to go register for the tax in your town of ancestry, but you could pay the tax in your hometown where you were living at that time. Joseph and Mary did not go to Bethlehem to pay a tax. They went to register for a tax that they would pay in Nazareth. All right? But they had to know what is the ancestral town? What is our ancestral town? And by the way, it was the same town for Joseph and Mary. They both were descendants of David, and their ancestral town was Bethlehem. Okay, you starting to get this? Now, I want to look at um, another real interesting thought. When you start studying genealogies and how important they are to the Jewish people, in 70 A.D., a Roman general led his troops, a Roman general by the name of Titus. He would go on to, later on he would become an emperor of Rome, but he led his troops into Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Guess what else they destroyed? All of the genealogical records of the Jewish people. All right. All destroyed. There is not one Jewish person who is alive today who has the records to their ancestry. They were all destroyed. This is devastating to the Jewish people. 
we can't trace our ancestry because they've all been, the record's been destroyed. But there's something real cool that I want to share with you this morning. You get to uh, Revelation chapter 7. And in Revelation chapter 7, you have uh, the 144,000 witnesses who will be witnesses for Christ during the tribulation period. Revelation 7 specifically states there will be 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes. Add that up, that's 144,000 Jews. They don't know what their genealogical records are, but God does. See, He is not dependent upon genealogical records in order to prove ancestry. God knows every single one of those 144,000 they are going to be witnesses of His. He knows what tribe they are from, and He knows every single one of them by name. Just let just percolate on that a little bit. It's amazing. They don't know who they are. He knows who they are. That's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. So let's look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Well, let's start with the name Jesus and the title Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. All right? A lot of people think his name is Jesus Christ. It's not. Jesus is his first name, Savior. Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. So we've got a genealogy of Jesus the Savior who is the Messiah, the Anointed One. And the first thing it says here, he's the son of David, he's the son of Abraham. That is actually in reverse order. Abraham came before David. So why would David be first? Why would he come first? Let me give you some thoughts here. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. God gives a promise to King David. He says, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will be his father and he will be my son. Who is that a reference to? The David's son who would build a house, build a temple. Solomon, it's obvious. By the way, Solomon was not David's firstborn son. Solomon was David's tenth son. If you ever wonder why there were so many of David's sons trying to steal the throne from David, they thought they had a rightful place to do that. David's successor was Solomon, son number 10, not son number 1, his firstborn. Solomon's brothers thought they had a right to the throne. All right. Now, as you think in terms of that, it goes on in 2 Samuel 7, 16, in God's promise to David. It says, your house... And your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is no longer a reference to Solomon. Because Solomon's kingdom was not forever. It was not eternal. This is now a prophecy that someone that's coming through that line of David will have a kingdom that will live forever. This is Jesus. This is, what is, this is what the angel Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. He will be great. This is referring to Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. 
that promise, that prophecy that was given to King David was fulfilled in Jesus. All right? Now, why this genealogy of Jesus is so important, the first reason is the genealogy proves Jesus was a descendant of David, and as a result, he came through David's kingly line, his lineage. This would have been extremely important to the Jewish people because you could not have a, uh, a king that did not come through David's line. All right, That was the prophecy. Jesus was the ful fulfillment of that prophecy. In order for Jesus to qualify as the Messiah, he must be a literal, physical descendant of David. And both Joseph and Mary were descendants of David. Now, this is where it gets confusing. And if you're a little confused by this, I understand. Hopefully I can shine a little light on some things about Joseph being a descendant of David. And it gets a little confusing here. Okay. But we'll look at that. If you look at verse 16 of the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Matthew does not say that Joseph was the father of Jesus. This is very clever, all right? How does he refer to Joseph? Joseph is the husband of Mary. Joseph was not the physical, biological father of Jesus, and that's what Matthew is alluding to here. But he's saying Joseph is the legal father, the legal earthly father of Jesus, and he was a descendant of David. Okay. Now, if you're confused by that, let me confuse you a little more. It says here, he's the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. That whom is feminine. It modifies Mary. Jesus was born of Mary. He doesn't say Jesus was born of Joseph. Joseph was the husband of Mary. That's very important. Okay? Very important. However, in Jesus' day, the Jews believed that Joseph was the physical, biological father of Jesus. That's what the Jews believed. They were wrong, but that's what they believed. And by the way, that's what you and I probably would have believed. And I want you to think about this. Throughout their marriage, Joseph and Mary were considered by everyone as being the parents of an illegitimate child. There's another genealogy of Jesus that is given to us in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. The genealogy that is given to us in Matthew is the genealogy that comes through Joseph. The genealogy that is given to us in Luke chapter 3 is the genealogy that comes through Mary. Matthew wrote his book to the Jews. Luke wrote his book to the Gentiles. Luke is the only Gentile writer of the New Testament that we have. He's very unique in that sense. All right. Now, Luke, in giving the genealogy of Jesus, beginning at verse 23, says something very interesting about Joseph. He says... He says this about Jesus. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. In 
Now, don't miss that, because that's what the Jewish people thought. Jesus was the son, so it was thought of Joseph, okay? In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Oh, oh. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 and 55. When Jesus came home to his hometown of Nazareth, the people asked him, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? See, that's what the Jews thought. Jesus was, to them, the physical, biological son of Joseph. So Matthew's going to go with that. And he's going to give you a genealogy for the legal father of Jesus. Does that make sense? He's saying, if this is what you believe, well, let me give you his genealogy here. It goes even farther than this. This is where it gets real interesting. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David. Jesus qualifies to be a king because he was a descendant of David. That's why this genealogy is so important. It proves that Jesus was the Messiah. It proves that Jesus was the anointed one that was promised and prophesied to King David clear back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. How many of you think you really know the Christmas story now? See, this is the stuff that bothers me. We've gone to church for so long, we think we know these stories by heart, and then when a pastor gets up to preach, we get bored and we tune him out. Oh, I know all about that. Really? Did you know what I, what I just said? That's the Christmas story, my friends. There's a lot more to it than what we think. A lot more to it. So that's the first reason. The genealogy proved that Jesus was a descendant of David. The second thing that it, it, uh, it's very important for, the genealogy establishes Jesus as a historical figure. Very important. You see, our faith is not based on myth or legend. Our faith is based on facts. Jesus actually walked this earth as a man. We have proof. He has a genealogy. You might as well say he has a birth certificate. Proof that he's alive. Third, and what I believe foremost, the reason why this genealogy of Jesus is so important, it displays the scope of God's grace. That's why I've called this a genealogy of grace. I'm a preacher of grace. And I see a lot of grace in the New Testament. I see a lot of it. I see it everywhere. I see it in the parables. I see it in a genealogy of Jesus. Grace. Well, where do you see it? 
In this genealogy of Jesus, you have 47 names. All right? 42 are males. Five are females who are never included in Jewish genealogies. Women aren't included in that. But in the genealogy of Jesus, we have five women included. We've already talked about Mary. Let me tell you about the other four. The first one is given to us in verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Tamar was a Canaanite woman. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Canaanite. An enemy of Israel. She married two of Judah's sons. One's name was Ur. He died. They had no children. Ur's brother, Onan, marries Tamar. He dies. They have no children. There's a third son, but Judah's not real prone in wanting him to marry Tamar. Can you understand why? Everybody she marries dies. Tamar is not patient. She's not going to wait for this third son of Judah to come around. So she decides she's going to get together and she's going to Hatch a scheme. So she puts on the garb of a prostitute and she strategically locates herself in a section of a road in which she knows her father in law Judah is going to travel. He sees her, she's dressed like a prostitute, they sleep together. She gets pregnant from her father-in-law. They have two twin sons, Tira and Perez. This is a woman who's included in Jesus' genealogy. Let me give you the next one. Rahab, Rahab, Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab also was a Canaanite, not an, an Israelite. She was a Canaanite. She comes on the scene in Joshua chapter 2. She wears the label throughout the Bible, prostitute. By the way, it's much easier to give people labels today than it is to love them. Our society is pretty good at labeling people. We're not so good at loving people. So we have Rahab. Rahab. Her story's tied up primarily in the story that you have in the book of Joshua about the uh, conquest of Jericho, the walled city of Jericho. Hebrews 11.31 says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Rahab, somewhere along the line, became a believer in the God of Israel. That's why... Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 could start out with that verse, by faith. All right, by faith. She was the mother of Boaz. We'll get back to that. Who was the father of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David. Rahab was King David's two greats, great Great grandmother, Rahab, David's great great grandmother, a former prostitute. 
Interesting, isn't it? Huh. Let me give you the third one. Ruth, also mentioned in verse 5. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. They were enemies of Israel. She was Moabite. Boaz, however, said this about Ruth <clears throat> in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. She was a Proverbs 31 woman, Ruth. King James says she was a virtuous woman, a virtuous woman. Well... Ruth became King David's just one great, great-grandmother, Ruth. And that's how a person from a hated nation of Moab entered into the line of the Messiah. The fourth woman that is mentioned here is mentioned in uh, verse 6. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. She is not even given her name here. She is referred to as Uriah's wife. We know her as Bathsheba, woman number four. Bathsheba. She actually was an Israelite. We're told in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5, that her her father's name was Amiel. Amiel. The story of Bathsheba's adultery with King David is so well known that I don't even need to go into it. Don't even need to go there this morning. Think of those four women. Three are Gentiles, not Jews. Gentiles included in the genealogy of Jesus. Unheard of. Unheard of. So there's got to be a reason why. Of these four women, three are involved in some form of sexual immorality. Two are involved in prostitution. One is an adulteress. All four, however, are in the line that leads to Jesus Christ. Now, most of us would have cut these branches off our family tree. Not the Bible. Not the Bible. Martin Luther once said, Christ is the kind of person who is not ashamed of sinners. In fact, he even puts them in his family tree. Now, here's what I want to really bring home this morning as I'm concluding this message. Jesus' family tree is decorated with notable sinners. He would know what it feels like to have family members that embarrass you. He would know what it means to have a dysfunctional family. He would know what it is to be a part of a family where there was a lot of brokenness and pain. You look at his family tree. There's brokenness, there's pain everywhere in this family tree. Maybe yours is that way. It wasn't until just a few years ago I began to realize that that was the way my family tree was. For a while it seemed like our family was the kind of the Norman Rockwell family. And I'm not sure exactly where it started to happen to our family. But I can tell you this, Nancy's side of the family, there's a lot of brokenness. There is a lot of pain and dysfunction in her side of the family. We'll be seeing them this afternoon in Decatur, Indiana. My side of the family, 
there's a lot of brokenness on my side of the family and a lot of pain involved in my family tree. Some of you, maybe you're not in the best relationship with some of your family members that you're going to see this Christmas. You might even be dreading it. I've met people. They don't look forward to Christmas because they have to get together with their family that they have, the, the relationship's broken down. It's going south on them. You might be the only Christian in your entire family and you're not looking forward to the way that some of your other family members celebrate Christmas. Because they don't celebrate like you do. I want you to know, Jesus says, I understand. I understand what you're going through. I understand it. Look at my family tree. Look at my family tree. When you read the stories of these four women and of the men on the list, you aren't supposed to focus on the sin, but on the grace of God. The hero of this story, the hero of this genealogy is God himself. His grace shines through the blackest of human sin as he chooses flawed men and women and places them in Jesus' family tree. And he says, I understand brokenness. I understand pain. I understand family dysfunction. I understand it all. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for including these women in this family tree. And even some of the men, Lord, weren't the most noble of character. But you've spoken to me this week about this whole idea of Jesus understands. I never saw it that way before. His, his genealogy proves your grace. It proves that he understands what some of us who are a part of families that are far from perfect, dysfunctional in their own right, Jesus can relate. And I thank you for that. I pray for anyone who's here today that really is dreading getting together with family over Christmas. I pray, Father, that somehow you will minister to them, that you will use them, if they're the only believer in their entire family, that somehow, Lord, you will use them as a tremendous witness this Christmas. That you will open up doors of opportunity, not to force in the gospel, but doors of opportunity that you would, they would sense your, the leading of your Holy Spirit. Give them the right words. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. And I thank you for this genealogy of grace. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. You are dismissed.